All right, Broken Arrow. In the 60s, the U.S. Army had a term for if the enemy had been, if the enemy had penetrated the U.S. forces and they needed reinforcements, air support, because the enemy was inside the perimeter. The nature of this talk is about what happens, how can we help the domestic abuse victim who comes to us as information security professionals because the situation has moved from, and my slides, and here we go. Hang on one second, technical difficulties. I love my Mac. Oh, man. Sorry about this. I've got a little bit of a glitch. Darn. I'm going to have to punt. Okay, not a problem. Take your time, sir. Hey, Will, stand by. I'm going to set you back up again. I don't have any control for anything else on my screen. Yeah, hold on a second. I'm setting you back up. There you go. Try it now. All right. Do you have control? You should have control. Okay. Let me see if I can get someone else to help out. Uh, hold on. Yes, sir. Thank you for everybody who stuck around through this. I mean, we're, there probably should be a SANS course in uh, remote presentations after this is, pandemic is over. So the idea, of, we've heard the beginning about the enemies inside the perimeter. People come to us as information security professionals and they say, Instead of fix my desktop, I build a computer over the weekend. I'm setting up Wi-Fi. They don't want us to fix their situation. They're being stalked somehow by an ex, by a former partner, going through a divorce, split, what have you. But they come to us as information security professionals to say, can you fix my desktop? And like most people who get a jury ticket in the queue on a Friday afternoon, you want to do something. You want to be able to say, here's how I can do it. Here's how you fix this. A system architect versus somebody who's working on the blue team versus somebody who's doing digital forensics, it's a different skill set. The purpose of this talk is to give you a general framework on what we found as Operation Safe Escape, what the common things are that you're encountering when people are going through domestic abuse situations. I'm a volunteer with Operation Safe Escape. Uh, if you want to either A, work with us to help people get out of domestic abuse situations, the website is goaskgrows.com, safeescape.org. If you want to volunteer, help at safeescape.org. Or if people want to seek guidance to help digitally disconnect an abuser, help at safeescape.org is how people can reach us. Another good resource is uh, the Smart Girls Guide to Digital Privacy. Now that said, the three information security principles of data confidentiality, data availability, and data integrity, we take those, that triad and we apply it to this, of helping somebody get away from a bad situation. You want to control the environment, watch for identity theft, and then make sure you have data availability. That way you still have the cool little CIA triad there, but it means something just a little bit different. Now, out of these three, the most important is to control the environment, meaning not just the digital, but the physical environment. That's something we don't usually think about physical security in our daily jobs as information security. We might think about phishing, you know, dropping the USB drive by the entrance to the facility. But the hardcore physical security, making someone's physically safe, that's not usually in our swim lane. And for controlling the environment, whether it's you or somebody going through a bad situation, another three things to keep in mind, your personal security, the data security, and family disclosures. And by that, 
For personal security, the most important is to get off the X. When I was actively with CIA, uh, we had a overseas meetings go bad. The case officer came back to the station and the station chief, Marky, after hearing about how this situation just kept getting worse and worse and worse, had this gym. He said, no bad situation ever got better by sticking around. Whether that's a personal relationship with abuse, whether it's a bad job situation, a living situation, it's not going to get better by staying. It's okay to leave. And as I was going through this with the leadership team at Revolutionary Security, uh, Jim Pruitt, one of our leaders, said, you never have to ask permission to leave a dangerous situation. He gave the example of a uh, engineer who was in the field and people were out at a bar and they wanted to drive home in one car where the driver was drunk. The guy didn't want to take a cab because he was afraid of getting in trouble for having a separate expense. And that's where Jim's line, you never have to ask permission to leave a dangerous situation, applies to the domestic abuse front. If things are bad, leave and then figure out how to make it work afterwards. But the most important is to get off the X, to have a bug out backpack. Uh, this was a live physical presentation. I do a show of hands for who knows what a bug out bag is. But for the digital presentation, a bug out bag is a bag that you keep with you, whether it's a backpack, purse, knapsack, with a credit card, your driver's license, important documents, passport, birth certificates, your laptop if you can, phone, a phone charger. That way, if you have to leave at a moment's notice, you can leave and then begin to rebuild your life after you have a bad situation. You want to keep your electronic devices with you with the caveat of what if you're stalkerware on those devices, and I'll show you how to defeat that in a minute. If you have the ability, not everybody in the audience or not everybody we encounter is going to have this, but consider having a prepaid cell phone and a prepaid credit card somewhere outside, whether it's in your office, a friend's house, so that if the abuser disconnects your cell phone, disconnects the credit card, uh, deactivates the credit card, excuse me, you still have the ability to at least get a hotel room for the night or two to contact people to let them know what's going on, just in case you have that loss of service, you know, a backup plan, your basic RAID service. We talked a little bit about what happens, how to flee the situation, and we'll get into that more. But what if they leave? What if the abuser leaves the situation and you're left behind in your house, in your condo, in your apartment? Most important thing, consider this. Of course, change the passwords. I'm going to say that a thousand times in the next 45 minutes. What I would do, hypothetically, I would call the landlord, I would call a locksmith, whoever controls the physical lock to the house, change the locks, change the key codes. The law enforcement officers are going to respond differently to an abuser returned to the house versus an abuser broke into the house. That's going to get a different level of response and get more help for you so a bad situation doesn't occur. So in this timeline, as the locksmith is coming, as the landlord's coming to change the locks and garage door codes, start to change your passwords. And I've got here, a lot of people have suggestions from these talks, I've incorporated them. Change your garage door remote access frequency because sometimes if the car has the garage door access code programmed into the car itself, all the, former person has to just drive up to the house, hit the garage door code, they're back in the garage. A lot of people don't lock your garage door, they're back in. So remember to change that garage door code too. So you got a couple of physical things to change here. And the importance of changing all the codes is this. Transmits the clearance code for geo passing. To know the code so that it checks out. In domestic situations, such as a father and his two children having a disagreement, such as Anakin, Luke, and Leah, an older code still checks out. A lot of people forget to change the basic passwords and the basic passcodes. After a divorce, do you remember to change your garage door code, your access code? Harden the perimeter first and then work forwards to change your router passwords. 
change your security questions because if you can go to genealogy.com, ancestry.com, simple Google search, it's not a OSINT exercise to be able to find basic information on people. Go to a known safe machine, change your security questions and your passwords, but it's okay to lie online. That's one of the key takeaways for this presentation. When creating a new security question, fabricate your favorite locations, your informations and events. They're not looking for accuracy, or excuse me, they're not looking for truth, they're looking for accuracy. Where did your parents meet? Tatooine. What was your high school mascot? An Ewok. What was, a, uh, when did you get married? On Naboo. It doesn't have to be where you truly got married, it just has to be whatever the system is told is your answer. Something that's not easily searchable. Don't get so cute that you can't remember the answers to your own security questions, but make it something that you can remember. It's okay to lie. Americans are trained from, we're taught never to lie, to always tell the truth. Winston Churchill said it's okay, the truth is guarded by a bar, um, yeah, I can't talk today, too much Coke Zero. The truth is protected by a bodyguard of lies. Definitely apply that here. You don't have to tell the truth about your security questions. Looking at your router, it's a little bit of an abrupt transition. You come in, you've got to change your passwords. First thing is to look at your router screen, see what other devices are connected, take a screenshot. That could be evidence for later. So here you've got a Galaxy X8, you have a Mac laptop, an iPhone renamed PC. You don't have to name your device Jim's iPhone. It can be whatever you want. If it's something very specific, Colonel Sanders iPhone, you're coming to the top of the attention if anybody's using Cali or looking at logs that this is someone specific's iPhone connecting. Different talk altogether, but harden yourself and not have the exact name of who you are on your phone. So here we see there's no rogue devices connected. And we'll come back to that in a minute. This is key for these situations. Take a screenshot if there is. And again, this talk can't cover every router that's in production. Remember to search for your specific router. Look at the logs just like you would in a nine to five job, looking at the logs with Splunk. Capture the logs to see if there's any anomalous traffic there that doesn't belong. So you've changed your, the locksmith is coming. You've changed the Wi-Fi password. Now you go to your smartphone to change this. While you're changing your password, things to look at. You go to settings, and then you go to scroll down a little bit, and you can see the number of devices you are connected to, that middle picture. And that's the number of Apple devices that are sharing your ID. It's very common where people think they're InfoSec gurus, they're hacker elite, they're hacking the planet. They add themselves to their spouses, former spouses, iPhone, so they're getting drop copies of all the messages. The next thing you want to go to find my iPhone and see where your device is located because you're giving the opposition a blue force tracker to see everywhere you're looking. And you can see the number of devices that you can track through this account. You'll want to take screenshots one, then disable it. Next thing we want to go to share my location and family sharing. Very simple for this for this talk. You don't want to share your location. You don't want the opposition, we'll just call it that, the opposition to know where you are at every moment going through a situation where you're fleeing an abuser. The second thing we saw this working with NATO Special Forces in some at uh, the agency where people had photo sharing set up with family. So when they're taking pictures of the war zone of whatever site, whatever battlefield, their cool guy hero photos, those photos were getting shared back to their kids, their spouse, their grandmother phone, their phones. Definitely in a combat situation, intel situation, you don't want to have that enabled. But the same here, if you're going through an abuse situation, you don't want to share your new life or documentation of evidence with the abuser. You want to make sure this is turned off. Whether they enabled it, whether you enable it at this point, it does matter, but turn it off. A new one, Apple keeps adding features. We'll call them features. I call them security risks, but they call them features. Test text message forwarding. So here we have this text message forwarding to two devices. This is set up to go to both of my Macs. That's finally good. I know these devices, these are mine. 
But if this goes to the opposition's phone, your iMessage and your SMS messages that go to your i account, iOS account, are now copied over to the opposition's device as well, so they can see everything you're doing. One case I worked, the uh, former spouse had five years worth of legal battles for custody, increase in child support, just constant harassment, all because it was something as simple as the spouse knowing where her text messages were coming from. So if she said, I'm going out to have a glass of wine with friends, I'll see you at five o'clock at Fredo's. On Monday morning, it was, here's papers from my attorney. You went out drinking this weekend and left the kids unattended. It's a fabrication, but he only knew this because the text messages were forward. On the other side of the aisle with the Android, you'll want to go and look at the number of places you've logged into your Android phone and where that's also shared. So this is, the Android message is showing up, the G, I can't talk today. The Gmail account is showing up on a Windows account, on an iPhone and a Mac, you want to take a screenshot of where the malicious account is showing up and then disable it. The next thing you'll want to definitely change your password again, safe machine, because your Google Takeout account. If you've not looked into the Google Takeout capability, it's something that we've used at uh, Revolutionary Security for insider threats. We used it at NATO to look and just show the troops where this data is still shared. It's everything you've ever done when you've signed into an Android account, your uh, cell phone locations, your cell phone tower locations, your deleted text messages, your deleted emails, your photos, your web traffic history. It's everything ever done with that Google account. That's something once you lose that, you can't get it back. That's a treasure trove you can parse through. Uh, Magnet Axiom. Magnet has donated some great li a free license of Axiom to Operation Safe Escape. We've parsed through some Google takeout for abuse victims, and we were able to see all the data that was deleted off the device showing that they were compromised. We were able to recover that with the victim's help through Google takeout. I say that because you don't want to lose this to the opposition. On the Apple side, Apple security, I believe, is a little bit better. It takes multiple steps for validation to request the backup data. You can see on the side here, the slides will be available. You can see all the data that's available from Apple. It's a seven day download waiting period for the opportunity to then download the data. It takes multiple steps again to validate two-factor authentication, password, security questions to download the data. It's pretty secure, I'm impressed with it. So yes, this data is available from Apple, but the the level of detail to get it is a little bit more robust and much more secure than Google. On the Facebook, this is one of the most egregious, I believe it's worse, it's as bad as TikTok in my opinion. Go to security, settings, and then active sessions, see where you're logged into Facebook because not only can they shadow you, Facebook Messenger keeps a copy of all of your messages. The, uh, the U.S. TCOM providers would keep at most three days of text messages between A to B. They would have the record that Alice texted Bob, but not the details. Facebook Messenger records this file of who you talked to, the body of text, the photos, and then who you called, how long you talked to, and that's kept for at least a year, which is prime for abuse, harassment, seeing if you're talking to an attorney building a case against you or just general harassment. So this is the holy of the holies. This is what you want to keep the opposition from gaining. That's why you've got to change your password for Facebook and lock down your two-factor authentication. Other ways, one particular case, she lost control of her Apple account. There was a shared family Mac in the living room she left. All he had to do is go back here. This is NQ's 2017 from before the world changed, back when we had physical conferences. Go to your keychain access, type in keychain from Finder, and then search for the Google account. This is just an example, whether it's Gmail, Facebook, whatever, Reddit. If you store your password, it's stored in clear text. All you have to do is type in username and password. So the NQ's 2017 password with the username and password is guidance. This technology still exists in Apple. They're still using it. 
this is a huge vulnerability. People aren't aware that you can gain someone else's password in clear text with just two or three easy steps on a map. I say be persistent and thorough. If you leave a USB drive behind when you leave a house, this US, this photo was off of a USB drive that was given to me by a private investigator that they thought they wiped. They hadn't. These are a recovered text message that somebody deleted off their phone. The PI recovered, put on a USB drive. He thought he deleted it. And something as simple as this drill, a $70 program online, was able just to recover this file. So if you're going to leave data behind, wipe it, don't delete it, because deleted data can be recovered and used against you. Persistent and thorough means your smart devices, your Netflix account, your Facebook. A neighbor bought a 65 inch TV off of Facebook Marketplace. It's easier to buy this than locally than try to transport it across town and move TVs are becoming incredibly cheap. The person who logged, left their Facebook login, as well as their YouTube and their Twitter, the question is who's looking at Twitter on 65 inches? I, you know, the person who's attorney, she logged out of the accounts. You know, you don't want to lose your license because you're cyber stalking in general, but there's nothing good that comes out of this. So when you leave the scene, if you're leaving the domestic abuse situation, logging out of Facebook into the smart apps on your device, make sure you do that because unless you know to go back and look at your Facebook account, you're going to forget about this and somebody can easily stalk you through your continued log on. The data is still out there, so there are issues, not issues, there are apps available through GitHub where you can plug in someone's Facebook ID and gain their sleeping pattern. If you're going through a domestic abuse situation, everything that's out there can be harvested, whether it's for the little bit too creepy, too personal ads, or whether it's somebody using this against you now that you've got a new sleep cycle, knowing you're working nights instead of days. This data is still out there. I would highly recommend not to use social media at all. That comes from my working in counterintelligence at CIA and you know being a part of this community. A lot of people still like Facebook. This is just one of the reasons you might want to reconsider it. Family and friend disclosures on Facebook are one of the more damaging ways. Uh, working with NATO special ops, we saw them. My husband's being deployed to Afghanistan, but I'm not supposed to tell anybody, don't tell anybody, and they post it on Facebook. Carrie Underwood had the quote here about, I'm going to a restaurant and my parents talk about what I'm wearing when I go to this restaurant. She's wearing her new sweater. They've got to follow operational security as well. Otherwise, if you lock your accounts down, but your family and friends still leak it out, you have the hard choice of having a tough discussion with them or not discussing anything with them. Neither one's good, but it still gives you a better optic for your safety than just letting things go. Getting into some of the more Internet of Things, I hate that acronym, but here we are, the IoT. I don't know how many people, again, this is where I'd have people raise hands back in the former world. If you've ever gone back and looked at a ring doorbell recording, the uh, 1080p, the 4K quality is phenomenal. The audiovisual recording for these always on systems. I helped local police. There was a car crash, two in the morning. Local police aren't very technical. They asked me to get involved to help with concurrence from the homeowner. Went in and gathered the data of the audio and the video. We were able to zone in, see the crash, see people fleeing the scene, joking about the drugs they're on. And point is with this, it's easy to add somebody to an access control list to be able to watch this, but people don't think that to remove the X whoever from the ACL, just like you would at work. If you're going to put them on an insider threat list for giving two weeks notice, if you know somebody's moving out, change your ring doorbell so that the X doesn't have access to your new life. Because with this ring doorbell, they can see someone new comes to the doorstep, police attorneys, doesn't matter. Couple that with Amazon Alexa's ability to record your and review your voice history. All you have to do is go to Amazon Alexa, look at the URL. You can go through and review every time you've said, hey, Alexa. You can see the smart history, the voice history. And not only that, if you have access to this, change your password. 
then you can disable the burglar alarm. You can disable a smoke alarm. Back in 2012, when CSI Cyber first came on, Swift on security and other people on Twitter were laughing about how far-fetched and ridiculous CSI Cyber was. There's a murder case where someone disabled the smoke alarm, then overheated the print jet on a laser printer to cause a fire, which caused a murder. That was ridiculous in 2012. Now, with Amazon, that's getting into the realm of possibility. So again, make sure you change your username and password. NSA doesn't have the rights to watch, to have a listening audio device in your house, audio visual device. These are nice, they're convenient, but they do give the opposition the ability to see what's going on in your house. Going from that, on the financial side, I'm a certified fraud examiner, former banker. Unless you explicitly move the opposition from the Amazon account, you might want to close the joint account, remove your joint credit cards, because unless you explicitly remove the other person or your credit cards, you are still responsible. They can max out your Amazon credit card. You're liable for it, despite the fact there's a divorce in process. You didn't remove them. You implicitly allowed this to go on. It's a financial risk, but it can be quite substantial. So moving a little bit here, we've got a lot of ground to cover thanks to the technical issues on my side. On the printers, a lot of Microsoft-based printers or Microsoft drivers will retain former printed files. So if you still have a laptop connected to a printer, you can go in and see the print queue for that machine, recover those. On the offensive side, you can see where the person took your money, where they're going, the new apartment they've gone off to. If you're looking for them, Defensively, if you've left this behind and you don't want to leave a trace, it's easier to buy a new printer, take the laptop with you and replace them if you have the ability, then leave this behind and recover the data. The, micro, the Windows side, if you go to bar spool cups, the, the principle here, everything that starts with C, you can remove with metadata. The ones that start with D, D0016-001, you can drag and drop that file to your desktop and view the PDF. The files that start with C, all you have to do is just run a simple strings query against that file name and it's going to pull out the header of it. I don't know if you guys can see it here, but there we go. So this, it's a coupon for a world market, big deal. Someone got 25% off of something that was marked up 125% anyway, big deal. But the example remains, you can still see the metadata of the files that are printed on this machine, which if you're leaving the abusive situation and they can see application for new job, application for new apartment, they can begin to piece together what's going on with your life, might want to consider taking that laptop with you. Getting into a little bit more nefarious things for email, mail, PDF, social media tracking. And this is not a how to stalk somebody guide. This is a dual threat guy. This is how people are, marketing companies are monitoring you. Superhuman in the middle gives you a marketing, the ability to see when the email was open, where it was open, and how often it was open. There's an embedded pixel in there. So you can see when they opened it, where they opened it, the pattern of life as they travel to open the document, which if you don't load remote images, that's an easy thing to do. For this, for B-Side San Antonio, yes, we understand that. For the average user, that might be something they're not aware of. This is a vector that could be done. Gmail has also added this feature to see where this email has been opened. Couple that with docs in for Outlook, and there's an embedded code within the PDF, which beacons back to tell them how long the file was open, where it was opened, what pages were open, where they spent the most time, and what pages were skipped. For corporate discussions, if you knew that page four had the most sensitive data that you're most concerned about the opposition negotiating against you and you knew they skipped over it versus they're, they keep coming back to page four, you've got insight as to what they're doing. On the domestic abuse side, I know she read this document. I know he read this document. He was here when they read it. They're getting blue force tracking level of detail as to what you're doing with this document and where it is. On a Mac, go to terminal, type in MDLS, metadata list, drag and drop that PDF, hit enter, and you'll see the cookie, the beacon that where it comes from, cloudfront.net in this case, 
and you can see the data. We spent several hours at the NATO soft classroom looking to replicate this with the troops. And I'm looking for somebody to come back and say, here's a simple way to do it. Coming before an audience of this technical acumen, we have not identified an easy way on Windows machines to show that this has a beacon that somebody's tracking when you open this file. And the easy way to mitigate this is to freaking print it. It's very basic, very simple. You get the document, you print it. There's no tracking for printed paper. That's very simple. You might kill a tree, but you have your privacy. That's a little bit better in these situations. Coming back to the real world, this is something, there's a little bit of groundswell to push back on the U.S. Post Office. Informed delivery, if you have the right credentials, the right post office, excuse me, the right driver's license, if you're leaving, knowing you're leaving your abusive victim, you can get man in the middle, I'm sorry, informed delivery, that's what they officially call it. It's going to let you see the PDF or JPEG of every document being delivered to that PO, not PO box, a, a post office box or mailbox. Worst case scenario, uh, letters from attorneys, checks, summons to court, sensitive documents. If you know those are going to the mailbox tomorrow, you pull the one document out, or in 2020, if you don't like the way the other person's voting and they have a uh, absentee ballot coming, you remove that ballot, you remove their ability to vote, that's a different level of felony, but it's still the same capability. The only way right now that the victim would know that man in the middle informed delivery has been enabled is either A, if they choose to enable informed delivery themselves and find it's already enabled, or B, if they go to the post office and physically ask if this is enabled on their PO box. Depending on a lot of factors, people don't want to go to a P, uh, post office and have physical interaction right now. This is a major vulnerability and something to look out for during these abusive situations. A couple other things uh, audience have had me add into this, iCal and Google calendars. So if you have something like TripIt, uh, Concur, or even webinars like this, and you add it to your shared calendar and you forget to remove the other person from your shared calendar, they're going to have your itinerary, they're going to have your confirmation, your seat number. If somebody was truly malicious, they could call the airline, call the hotel, this is so-and-so calling for John Smith, here's his confirmation number, I want to uh, cancel it. Do a cross-country trip, assuming we ever fly again, and you get there, there's no hotel waiting for you because it was canceled. It's simple, just remember, just like at work, just like in the SOC, you want to call the ACL for somebody departing, even down to your trip at your concur, your shared calendars, so that this can't happen to you or the victim. Now, social media stalking. Let's take another time. Belarus, 1.14 a.m., 1.15 a.m. from Hawaii, 1.15 from Kingdom, Saudi Arabia. And when I was working with NATO, you can see it's... Uh, Saudi Arabia, Moscow, Islam, uh, Iran, we know this isn't real. It's not possible to travel that far this quickly. That's obviously not true. But what is true, if you go to tinfoleak.com, you can see all these tweets were posted between iPhone and the web application, which means this Twitter account has an iPhone. You can begin to use that to reverse engineer to send a malicious payload to try to hack back into their phone. That's inadvertent disclosure of uh, vulnerability. Just because part of this means it's not true doesn't mean it's all doesn't mean it's all bad information. You know, the GRU GQ, he recommends you signal use Tor. I say assume your devices are compromised. Uh, programs that are meant for you know monitoring your child's use of technology, FlexiSpy for monitoring smartphones. If it's an Android phone, they would send you a link, a phishing link, you click on the link, and now your phone can be cloned by a Lexi spy and they can see what you're doing. If you have a iPhone, we'll touch on that in a second, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So assuming your meetings, 
Assuming your electronics are compromised until you know they're a good use, personal meetings, leave your electronics behind somewhere routine and secure. If you work at a vet's office, leave your phone at the vet's office, go have your meeting with your attorney, with your family, come back to where the phone is, the stalker wouldn't know. Have a nonverbal parole for family members. Like if you're a big Ohio State fan and you wear a Michigan shirt on your Facebook profile one day as the signal saying, there's something wrong, please come get me. You've sent your beacon for help out. No one else aside from those who would know what this means would know that we need to go get Jane, something's going on. So this is something you'd have arranged at a physical meeting without any electronic signature. The iPhone monitoring for FlexiSpy, again, change your password. And somebody who does digital forensics, when they say that this is iPhone monitoring, it kind of pisses me off a little bit because it's inaccurate. What FlexiSpy does, A provides B, the red screen is like the big emphasis points for DEF CON or other conferences for this is the core of take this away, this is hands-on, this is useful information, please implement this. So for the iPhone monitoring, Alice provides Bob's Mac ID and password to mSpy. Bob's iPhone now has to be synced to the cloud to create a backup. There are a lot of ifs here already. And then mSpy downloads and images and parses the data into a report for Alice. That's not hacking. That's just you've got someone's password and you're getting a copy of their phone. Which Again, all you do is change your password in this scenario where the stalkerware meant to monitor children, the stalkerware is rendered useless. So again, change your password. Again, be thorough and persistent with this. Uh, I've got a couple of new advances I like this. Trapping your device. In all the travels I used to do for CIA and a lot of the travel I do for revolutionary security, I use sleep cyclets on my phone that uses the potentiometer on your phone to see how well you sleep in a certain bed type. You know, some hotels have this brand mattress, some have Serta, some have a sleep number, whatever. And you can see where you sleep the best and what condition. So when it's time for a new mattress, you know what works for you or just general fitness, whatever. But the same technology can be dual purpose so that it's on your phone. So you can see if you're sleeping in the middle of the night, your phone is picked up and someone's looking at it. You can see there's a spike at 3 a.m. Someone touched your phone. Couple of that, if your phone's on top of your bug out bag, you can see someone not only moved your phone, they went through your bag, you've got a clue, an indicator that there's something wrong, you've been compromised. This is new, I love this. So you go to settings on your iPhone, you go to battery, your battery charge level, and then you can start to drill down hour by hour and see what applications were open. So at 3 a.m., if you see your iMessages, your Twitter, your signal had been active when you were sound asleep you know someone is definitely going through your phone there's something going on that's a huge indicator of compromise and this is built into the software there's nothing you can do about it you can't disable it this is native to the ios now so a smart excuse me a secure clean machine the Apple operating system has a recovery partition built in. You hold down control R and go to get help online for an issue with your machine. A little bit of serendipity here that get help online if you're reaching out to safeescape.org or if you're reaching out to an attorney family friends, you're operating off a partition of the Mac that malware can't reach at this point, knock on wood. So control R, go online, and unless you've got somebody who's very technical running Splunk on your home network and then running Kali to, in Wireshark to see what you're doing, you've got a clean way that they can't touch the keystrokes for this and see what you're doing with your machine to get help online. It leaves no trace on this. It goes back to a pristine state every time you come back in. So that's just Command R on startup and go to get help online built in the Mac. It wasn't the original purpose of Apple, but it definitely works. So this touched the social media. We've got about 17 minutes left. I've got to kick it up a speed here. You found a device in your living room. Electronic surveillance device installation isn't, you know, DSMP anymore. It's not director of science technology. You don't have to take years of training. It's as simple as this. 
you have power, you have media, and now you have the audio video storage bug with AC power available from Amazon. The triad here is you have power, collection, and storage. If you're going to have constant collection, you know, beaming out audio video, you're going to have to go straight to the cloud, which means AC power, or you're going to have limitations on that power because you can only run that battery so long until it dies, which requires physical collection. If you're doing intermittent collection without much power, you can have more storage. You see how the three play off of each other. All these devices are available from Amazon. You would think this is something you're getting from 20 years ago, be something you know, classified, but now it's suggested through Amazon, thanks to you know, researching for these presentations. This is a 1080p HD camera, audio video, but because the power limitation, power draw it has to be connected to the power, AC power of a house, connects to your router. Remember earlier I showed you this router screen? This would show the clock is connected to the router. One, it's 2020, who uses physical clocks anymore? The mitigation for this, a new clock appears, unplug it, put it away, boom, easy, solved. Now you might want to document this for your attorney for later or law enforcement. This is definitely a felony. You can't have monitoring of somebody in your house. You know, again, check with your local laws. Though. The air freshener, 720p camera, audio video, runs off a battery, stores to a smart card that requires physical access to change this. The um, USB drive, you flip the switch one way, the curved notch. One way it's uh, continuous recording for 128 hours, put the notch the other way, it's short burst recording of up to 128 hours. The difference is one, you're only getting somebody talking versus 128 hours of parsing through the tape. So these are different ways that if somebody's, excuse me, still monitoring you, they can collect against you, but these would require physical collection. So in a domestic abuse situation, an ex situation where the kids are going back and forth, you have the perfect vehicle. You have a camera in here, microphone, battery, and limited storage so that when the bear goes back to the ex's house, they can switch out the battery, they can switch out the USB, SD card, what have you, and they have insight for what happened with the kids while they are at the ex's, or the teddy bear goes in mom or dad's office and the teddy bear in one case was used to shoulder surf, gather passwords for another stalking case, which eventually got referred to law enforcement. But you have to think, why is this being brought here? Why is this coming and going? And here's how I'm vulnerable. These are not hard devices to detect once you know what you're looking for. The one caveat, if you do have an electrician who wires audio video monitoring into a house surreptitiously, that's a different level of monitoring. Law enforcement is definitely interested. That would get someone some free meals for the next 10 to 15 years. Apple means well, they really do. Another case we found with electronic surveillance is turning the ear pods and using those as hearing aids. All that would take is leaving the iOS device in, the, in one room, enabling the hearing aid option on the iPhone, which is native to the iOS now, and the abuser can be in the other room with the AirPods on, but using it as a hearing aid, and they actually use that as a remote listening device to hear the conversation two or three doors away, two or three rooms away. Something else to consider, why do they formerly take their phone with them all the time? Now they leave the phone behind, but they leave the AirPods, and that's odd. This might be what's going on, your privacy is at risk. Bluetooth collection, if you run something like Net Toolbox, you can run a Bluetooth scan to see what's in the house to see if there's any Bluetooth collection. Confirm if there's anything rogue in the device, like the teddy bear, like the alarm clock, if they're using that as the XFIL channel. And Bluetooth is promiscuous, so once it's in that P list, it's not hard for an investigator to, uh, P list is a method, it's the list of all the devices that are ever connected to, kind of like a database, if you will. So you can see this device with this Bluetooth address, this MAC address was placed into service two days after this fight. And I've been monitored. That's stored on your phone for perpetuity. That's easy evidence for the police to gather. 
coming into the home stretch, the physical tracking, you can actually buy a bug off of Amazon. It goes on some, underneath someone's car. It's $50 or $25 a month. It looks like an old cellular modem. And they mark it up for spouses. <clears throat> and it gives you a collection like this where you can actually see where the car has gone, which is really cool, except if I tell you that I lied to you, this isn't really collection from a bug. This is collection from GPS data from a Facebook, from a phone, from a case I was working. The GPS data was put on Google Maps as a uh, KML file. I don't need a beacon if I have access to your Facebook or your phone and can rip that file out with the GPS locations. You have a bug. You have to change your password so someone doesn't have access to your devices. Very simple fitness beacons. A lot of people like the GoPros. Not the GoPros, the yeah, fitness, the fitness trackers, they connect it to their Twitter, they advertise their runs where they've been. There was a murder case in San Francisco where it was someone was arrested because their Fitbit was beaconing out their daily run, which coincided with the murder. I like having dumb criminal, that makes jobs easier. But if you're worried about being stalked or the person who comes to you for help is worried about being stalked. As a mentor for B-Sides Vegas said, stop it. Stop wearing your beacon. Stop advertising where you're going. It's that simple to mitigate this risk. Just the world can live without knowing Susie's run. They don't need to know that Bob went to CrossFit and then ran for three miles. Nobody, if you're worried about being tracked, get rid of the tracker. Very simple. All right, well, again, this is too much. I'm going to order a pizza. Be persistent and thorough. When I was getting this talk together, I got lazy, ordered bad pizza. I went to Domino's. And I saw that not only was my ad address there, my phone number, my credit card stored, my past two years of credit, my past two years of pizza orders had been stored on there. So if your person coming to you for help, orders pizza every Thursday night, and the abuser knows this, it's easy to see where they're going for their safe house to get away from the abuser. Change all the passwords. All right, we are in the home stretch. A little bit happier, it's a heavy subject. Thanks for sticking through me. Identity theft, very simple. If you're in the US, go to identitytheft.gov and report it. In the fraud triangle and the divorce abuse situations, you have the rational, rationalization of, well, I deserve this. They've worked, I've worked so hard to support them. They're going to divorce me. I've got the opportunity. I've got their checks. I've got their credit card. I've got a copy of the passport. I'm going to be divorced. I won't have their income, but they owe me. A narcissist can go down this path of self justifying There's things like spoof card. You're going through a divorce situation. You put in Citibank's phone number. You call the target. Someone else calls the target. You know, we understand these charges are going through. <clears throat> we just need to verify A, B, or C. It looks like it's a correct situation. It's really the abuser coming back in to steal a little bit more before the case is over. Your guard has to be up for fraud. So you go to identitytheft.gov. You get a FTC, Federal Trade Commission, case number. They work with you. They work with the banks to report this. And it's very binary. If there's identity theft, you have to report it. If you don't report it, that means you're complicit. That means you are okay with what they've done to you. And you don't really have, the longer it goes after this has happened, the less of a chance the courts and the banks will work with you. Again, very binary. The technical means, am I being monitored? Is somebody stalking me digitally? Are they into my account? Yes, that's very complex. There's a lot of different venues we've touched on. Identity theft, either report it or don't. If you don't report it, that's on you. There's nothing else we can do for you, to be blunt. If you do report it, that goes to the FTC, the Consumer Commission, and you've got a lot of large corporations that will help you. Even if you go to the police with this and say, this has happened, they're going to send you to identitytheft.gov on a clean machine to report this. So the sooner you report this, the better. Lastly, we're getting into data availability. We talked about controlling environment, identity theft, the last data availability. The saying used to be, if it ain't in cable traffic, it ain't. If it ain't documented, it ain't. If you don't write down dates, times, events when they happen, whether it's just an email to yourself, <clears throat> an email to an attorney, to a friend, 
If it doesn't have that header for the metadata, the date time stamp of you reporting this, it doesn't matter. So documentation, that's hard. That's when you're working a IDA case, an intrusion case, a digital forensic case, domestic abuse, fraud case, if you don't document it, it doesn't happen. You've got to document these dates, times, and events with authorities, document the files. I found this event on this date, and here's what, do it as it occurs. You know, this like sand style practice. If you don't document when it occurs, you're going to have a backlash of files to document later, and good luck with that. Might come from first-hand experience, I can't say that for sure. The other thing about availability on the soft skill, be available for the other person. This isn't a PIMS ticket that comes into your queue. This isn't a help desk ticket, a uh, incident that comes in through cable traffic, however you get your alert to work. This is a person coming to you after hours with a life situation. They can't log out of this and walk home. This is their life. Be available if they want to talk, listen, if they want to go out for, to eat, if they can, you're part of the world. Do it. Be available for the other person. They're going through some hard times and they come to you for help. Be there for them because it's eventually going to end and they're going to remember how people were treated. So be a good person for this. Yeah, it sounds a little bit silly to say, but we get so lost in the ones and zeros sometimes that we forget that the ones and zeros are data that goes back to someone's life that we're helping them rebuild to defragment. And it's a necessary thing. The data availability, the data that you find, whether it's that printer queue we talked about, whether it's documents that have beacons embedded, that's the only copy. This isn't some multi-trillion, a billion dollar corporation. I recommend for the PACE plan, you have a primary, an alternate, a contingency copy, and an emergency copy. Personally, I like to make four copies, have one stored in a safe deposit box, one with an attorney, one with a branch chief, division chief, law enforcement, doesn't matter. You have a copy you're working from, but the primary is locked away. That way, e Murphy happens. It's the unthinkable, just like the beginning of the presentation where I can control my mouse and keyboard, it happens. Bad things are going to happen to data. So you want to make sure that these files, you've got redundant copies stored in multiple locations so that you can help this person rebuild their lives. Four minutes left. Firm, friendly, final, and fair. A little bit of social engineering here as we approach the end game. If you say, I don't want to be on your cell phone plan anymore because I think you're stalking me, that's going to be a hostile reaction. If you say, or the other person says, you know, things are getting a little bit tough. I've got this new job. I've got my own cell phone plan. Lie. No one's going to say anything. Lie a little bit. I've got my new cell phone plan through work. You know, here's my new number. You don't have to pay for this anymore. It's going to lower your bill. You put a little bit of a carrot and stick out there of benefit to them. You no longer have to pay that extra $40 a month. That's more money in your pocket. Isn't that great? But you've still removed them from access to your call data records, access to your text. And because of this, it's the same end game, but with a little, well, not a little bit, it's a lot smoother ending for the same outcome. Another thing for the outcome to touch on, if this does get to law enforcement with it, we as the InfoSec community has helped, have been helping assisting the abuse victim, we're going to be considered the guy or the gal whatever, and the black hoodie, the hacker who's doing all this malicious activity, we have to be beyond reproach in this. Even though you might know how to hack into somebody's whatever account, we definitely can't. In general, I shouldn't say that, it's supposed to be hackers, elite, haha, -ha, but you don't want to get involved and go to jail for someone else's domestic dispute. Be beyond reproach in this. A little bit of humor to close this out. Shared technology in a domestic conflict. One device had strong encryption, strong authentication, wasn't leaked, and wasn't able to share any secrets. The other device, weak encryption, and the device was white. How fast of a movie would Star Wars have been if C-3PO, they just run you know, data recovery? Oh, that's who my dad was. 30 minutes in the movie, game over. And George Lucas would have lost millions and trillions of dollars on merchandise revenue. Unauthorized devices on a network. Was it 2023 Nebula showed up in 2014? Thanos detected an unauthorized device on its network. 
He did live memory forensic analysis. Shout out to Andrew Case for this one. Uh, Google takeout analysis of location, chats, and images, and because there's an unauthorized device in his network, Thanos was able to respond to a threat. Conversely, the Avengers, because they lost the device, you had a man in the middle attack, a titan in the middle attack for you who like this. They lost all this data and they were unaware that Thanos had copies of all their plans and intents. Too long didn't read. Change your passwords over and over again on a known clean machine. Change your locks. Report the events to law enforcement as they happen. I hate to do it. I don't like dealing with law enforcement, but you've got to document to help the other person to get off the X to make their life better. Document events as they happen. Thank you. We're right at 5 p.m. I'm iOS Forensic, Will Bag 10X at engineer.com if you would like copies of the slides. I don't know if we're doing questions or not, but my email is right there, 10 x engineer.com. And thank you and appreciate being part of the conference.